Infrastructure Durance at Goddard and the, the uh, Goddard uh, Sysamin Community Practice Meeting. So uh, this is kind of what I had in mind uh, coming in as chair of this uh, group of community practice is that we're going to bring the most interesting things to the people who are interested in them. And if you're here, well, you must be interested. This is going to be a great talk. Uh, a couple of things that I uh, was always concerned about when I when I started uh, in the uh, chair role is I wanted to make sure there was some training that would happen, that we would get, be getting looks at some tools, and that we'd be able to talk about interesting topics like security and things like that. Uh, I guess last month we had a really fantastic uh, uh, security uh, roadshow, and uh, that was just happened to coincide with this meeting, and so I, well, that was this meeting, but we, we, didn't, we didn't really mention much about the community practice. Uh, I guess we've talked about in the past things like uh, storage, and we talked about Splunk, and uh, this presentation is going to be a bit different because it's our first talk about open source tools. And uh, open source tools are really important to NASA. Uh, I just gave Lance Albertson, who's our speaker, a tour of our data center in, in, in Building 32 S9, and there are 10,000 square feet uh, over uh, 890 computers, over eight petabytes of storage, and the amount of uh, the amount of software that we buy to run that is tiny. We're talking about a few compilers, a little bit of IDL, but all the rest is Perl running on CentOS. It's all running Postgres databases. It's running Apache. It's running P well, mostly Perl, a little bit of PHP, uh, and. The things we have the most trouble with and we were always getting rid of are the Javas, and we're always having to look at why we have to patch all this crazy uh, software that we buy. Shouldn't it be better than the stuff that we get for open source, the stuff we can open up the hood and see? Well, I think that uh, Lance probably agrees, or I don't know, let him say it, that open source is fantastic and it's, it's a tremendous resource for us and uh, certainly uh, I'm looking forward to this talk, and welcome to the community of practice. Thank you all for coming here, and thank you very much to, to Lance Albertson, who's going to be talking about Gennetti and our other private cloud platforms. But I'm not introducing him. Thomas is introducing him because he brought him here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and I'd like to thank the IHE and the COP for combining those this meeting today and providing the resources like the mailing lists and the WebEx and things of that sort. I also like to thank AdNet Systems for sponsoring Lance's trip in the first place and for the nice little spread of food that we have outside. Um, and then let's go to Lance. Uh, Lance is the director of the Oregon State University Open Source Labs. He has been involved in the Gen 2 Linux project as a developer and package manager since 2003. And since joining the Open Source Labs in 2007, Lance has managed all of the hosting activities of the OSL and provided about 160 high-profile open source projects. So they are hosting, using Gennady mainly, uh, a lot of open source um, projects and there they have uh, quite a number of hits and, and um, uh, resources. So Gennady is, although not very well known, it's really a tool that has proven to be useful and, uh, and easy to maintain. So you will see that in the talk today. He was recently promoted to director uh, after being the lead systems administrator and architect since 2007. And prior, since joining, prior to joining the OSU OSL, Lance was the Unix system administration administrator for the Enterprise Server Technologies Group at the Kansas State University. Please join me in welcoming Lance. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, getting me here. I made it here yesterday without the, the snow apocalypse or what is snow quester that didn't happen. Um, and it's great to be back in the D.C. area. It's a little bit sunnier out here, so I'm getting my vitamin D as much as I can. Um, but, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> he already kind of gave me my intro, uh, so I don't really need to cover this. But I might cover a little bit about what the Open Source Lab does. Um, we started about 10 years ago. Um, and basically started host, doing some co-location hosting for our Debian and the Gentoo project, and it just grew from there. So now we host projects like the Linux 
uh, the Linux Foundation, the uh, Python Software Foundation, the Apache Software Foundation, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And so we really try to provide stable hosting for all of these projects, whether it's co-location hosting, uh, managed hosting, so forth. Um, we also do some development projects on the side. One of them actually is related to Gennetti. And um, another side note, I am a jazz trumpeter too, so I like, I like, I like to do non-tech things, and that was one way to get out of that. Uh, but that's a little bit of background about me, um, just so you know where things are at. <coughs> this is my thing. There we go. So first off, disclaimer. <coughs> this presentation is of my opinions only. I have not done a scientific study of all of these. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, you know, I might be wrong in some cases, but this is coming from my point of view. And I should note, you know, I'm a heavy Gennetti user, so I'm a little bit biased. But I do see the benefit out of the other cloud platforms out there. But for me, it works really well. And um, <clears throat> as he said, yeah, like, open source really would the o open source lab wouldn't exist today without using all the open source tools that we ha we have. So it's really important to us. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to cover um, four rather uh, major infrastructures and service platforms. Um, kind of go over their components, what really you need to kind of look at, discuss their strengths and weaknesses, what they're really good for, what they're not so good for, some kind of best case uses for each platform, but I'm not going to cover any platform as a service or service as a service platforms. I'm strictly sticking to infrastructure as a service in this talk. <coughs> and as you notice, I, I'll have some pictures. Most of these pictures are from our data center back in Oregon for the open source lab, so this is our core router that has all of the bits for all the open source projects that go through it. So a little bit of uh, background. Uh, information from where I came from and how I got to Gennetti in the first place. So originally, before I even got to the OSL, um, the staff and students created a virtualization cluster using Zen um, and an iSCSI solution. So we had a couple of servers acting as the iSCSI target, and then we had a blade center that got donated running the nodes. Um, the management of it was horrible, um, but it worked. Um, but we got to a point where the iSCSI server couldn't handle the the storage load anymore it was just really, really slow. And so we started researching for an alternative tool. This was around 2009, I think, 2008, 2009. So this was pretty early on when the big cloud stuff was starting to happen. So um, <clears throat> the open source lab is primarily driven by students. And so one of our students actually did an internship at Google this one summer, came back and said, hey, I worked on uh, this project called Gennetti. You might check it out. And so I spent a couple months actually checking it out. And I had just timed it just right as they had just released a new major version release of Gennetti 2.0, which had a lot of improvements to it. And so we, we decided to go with it, wrote a couple of uh, tools to kind of make it better for us, and um, stuck with Gennetti and KVM ever since and haven't had a problem really with it. So <coughs> we really had some great experience with Gennetti. Um, I'll knock on wood, but we really haven't had a problem with Gennetti itself um, since we've implemented it. Um, you know, there's always the little quirks here and there, but all in all, it's been, been working really well. Most of our issues have been probably with KVM itself, um, but those have gotten much better over the years. Um, in the process, we really wanted to have our projects have an access, a web app front, front end access to the Gennetti. Gennetti is primarily command line driven, so we decided to create this Django project, and we created something called Guinea Web Manager, which I'll talk more about later. And you know, as it stands now, we're actually trying to find ways of augmenting our services with things that kind of fit with Gennetti, whether it means looking actually at OpenStack for some things that we want to do, or um, some other third-party pro projects like Synefo, which I'll talk about later, um, and so forth. So that's kind of the experience of how I got into Gennetti in the first place and, and kind of what came out of it. So. <coughs> I think we migrated about 60 virtual machines at the time to this platform, and it worked out really well. So where are we at right now with uh, private infrastructure service offerings? Well, for one thing, you have a lot of options, um, almost too many. It's hard to tell which ones you really want to have. Um, you know, A lot of them really tell how having AWS API support. So if you're dealing with the public cloud quite a bit, you know that can be important. If not, you, know, you don't have to worry about it. Um, the maturity of the projects vary quite a bit. Some of them are, have been around longer, while others are still quite young, and you quite don't know their stability. Um, they also kind of solve different problems. Um, 
you know, they tackle a specific type of a hosting situation that you wanted to do, and they kind of came out of that. Um, each platform really can vary in complexity. Um, you know, they can go from something pretty simple to having a whole bunch of different uh, components that are in it. Um, and so for me, as a sysadmin, I like things that are simple. I follow the KISS principle when I can. Um, so that's important to me. But that's, again, something to kind of consider. And there's always differences in the back-end architecture, whether you agree or you don't agree with how they have things deployed. So you know, that really plays a role in kind of the current state of how things are. <clears throat> so what do you want to have out of it? That's kind of what you need to think about when you look into what do I want to do with my virtualization. Um, and these are some of the key things that I would think about. You know, how easy is it for me as a, a sysadmin to use and to maintain and to upgrade? Um, how easy is it for, you know, regular user to interface with it? How often will they need to interface with it? Um, is it fault tolerant to hardware failures? Um, you know, what if you have a node goes down? How easy is it for you to shift resources around and, you know, move a VM to another host or bring another one up? Um, does it require a lot of extra hardware with this architecture? Some of these platforms require you to have multiple servers just to have a minimal system, um, while some of them you only need one, ma one machine to have a system to start out with. <coughs> and some of the uh, cloud platforms really vary in performance. And that really stems with how does the VM storage, or where does the VM storage actually live? Is it local storage, or is it a block device living on iSCSI, or is it over NFS, that kind of stuff. So it really varies quite a bit. Also, how easy is it to expand the cluster, you know? Things often change. You know, you thought you only needed three machines, but now you need ten. How easy is it for you just to add those ten, or is it going to take you a lot of time and effort to do that? Um, they each kind of vary. You know, does it matter to you that you have some kind of an API to do provisioning? You know, do you want to write a tool to be able to provi bulk provision quite a bit of VMs all at once? And do you want to have compatibility between other platforms like AWX or AWS or OpenStack? Or are you just needing you know, your own internal use and you don't really worry about that? And the last thing is, is uh, you know, do you really want to be able to provision really fast or do you want to kind of go through some extra hoops to, to deploy? Most of them are usually fast at provisioning in some way. But that's kind of things I look for when I was looking for a platform. <coughs> and each of these platforms really vary on quite a bit of things. So, uh, or they, they have f uh, the fairly same kind of components. So storage is probably the biggest thing. The first thing I look at is storage. How do they do storage? Um, does it have some kind of virtual machine image management? Um, you know, are users going to be able to create their own images and then spin up other instances from it? Are they going to be able to snapshot? That kind of a thing. Um, will they be able to self-serve themselves? You know, do they have a web interface or some other kind of API? Um, some of these also have networking built into it. So depending on your network layout, that may or may not be important. For us, it wasn't nearly as important because we had another system that manages it. But if you want to create a, uh, <coughs> a, you know, an environment where you have a private network for all your virtual machines, that you would want to have a system that can maintain that. Uh, you know, what kind of fault tolerance? I already mentioned that. User management, are you going to be dealing with a lot of users? Um, and the API, like, are you needing to uh, deal with the hybrid cloud? And uh, the biggest thing for me being a sysadmin is dealing with installation. Um, I actually try to at least install most of uh, these platforms myself, and it was a varying amount of installation ease. Um, I didn't actually get to do an upgrade, so I can't tell you how that is on some of these, um, but I do know, at least on Gennetti, how easy or not it is. Um, and then obviously maintenance is a really big deal. You know, Once you have a system up and running, um, how are you going to deal with upgrades, like I mentioned? So these are the four platforms that I'm planning on presenting on today. Um, Gennetti, obviously, OpenStack, CloudStack, and Eucalyptus. <coughs> these all seem to be the major ones out there. I think there are a few others, but I thought these were the most prevalent out there. Um, so I'll start, start with OpenStack, and you guys probably know about OpenStack, probably a little more than me, um, but it was started here in NASA and then spun out into Rackspace. Um, it was launched in 2010. It's probably one of the youngest plat cloud platforms out there right now. Um, it was really there to enable um, a lot of people to <laughs> create a lot of cloud computing services. And to me, it it's really engineered to scale really large. 
So if you're needing to scale huge, I think it's probably the way to go. Um, it has many, many corporations behind it now. So they're banking on OpenStack being the standard. Um, whether that happens or not, the jury's still out there. Um, this is one thing. I actually updated this slide. Um, it has even more components than last time I looked. Um, <coughs> basically, anything you can think of is being added to OpenStack. Um, so if you only want to deal with compute, you have that. Um, but I noticed they added uh, metering, they added some cloud orchestration, some, uh, uh, some block storage, and so forth. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of components to OpenStack. Um, that was one thing I noticed when I looked at OpenStack. I had no idea where to start with it because there were so many components. Um, I think the only way I could deploy it was by using the Puppet Labs OpenStack deployment module. Um, and I got it to work, but it was still like, I don't know, it would take me a long time um, to get it going. And, you know, being at the lab, I have limited amount of staff resources. And some, if, I, if I'm looking back now and I'd have to make the same decision, I probably wouldn't pick OpenStack because of the sheer amount of staff overhead to maintain it and training to get things going. Um, and at our scale, we don't need to deal with it. But, yeah, OpenStack, I think there's a lot of uh, possibility with OpenStack, but I th still think it's, it's, it's really young. Um, you're really not sure where it's going to go. <coughs> and, you know, with all those corporations, things keep changing. One backs out, another one comes in. Um, I kind of view this as a project that's run by committee kind of a thing, and that's not the best way to run an open source project. Um, so we'll see what happens. I think in the end, probably, um, you know, a community, a real community will form around it and, and keep supporting it. But um, that's how I feel about OpenStack, and that's really, really good. Um, Eucalyptus, how does it start? <coughs> it was actually started as a research project at UC Santa Barbara, um, and then they created a uh, company and commercialized it in 2009. Um, last year they had, uh, or before last year, they had two different versions. They had the open core version and the open source version. Um, they kind of got some backlash from the community for obvious reasons, and so they decided to go back to fully open source in 2012. Um, and they've made a lot of improvements. I remember um, hanging out with some canonical engineers that live in the Portland area, and they were trying to get uh, Eucalyptus to work in Ubuntu. And I can't remember. They had so much rage face when, when they, were, they were talking about it because it was so complex and it was so horrible to deal with. But I think it's improved quite a bit. Um, as far as components go, you have um, the various <coughs> areas. So you have the part that controls everything. The cloud controller, um, you know, it probably provides that web interface. You have the S3 storage called Walrus. Um, you have the other uh, co cluster controller that controls the execution of the VMs and their networking. You have another storage controller that's kind of like the block level EBS uh, storage that you want to have for your VMs. And the last one is actually the node controller, which co actually controls the VMs on the hypervisor and so forth. Uh, CloudStack. CloudStack was originally developed by Cloud.com. It was then open sourced and then purchased by Citrix in 2011. And then shortly thereafter, it was donated to the Apache Software Foundation. Um, I think it's technically called now Apache CloudStack. Um, I think Citrix is technically no longer doing direction of the development, but they are still heavily invested in it quite a bit. Um, it has a little bit simpler, and as far as its uh, components, they have a management server, they have hypervisor nodes, and then they have storage nodes. Um, and then they have various layers depending on how you want to pile things up. So you have a zone, you have a pod, which I think is kind of like a, uh, I can't quite remember how it works. And then you have a cluster of, of uh, nodes, and you have a host of primary and secondary storage. Um, this is the one that I didn't quite get to dive in as much as I wanted to, but it looked quite promising for, for something that, uh, compared to the other platforms at least. Gennetti. Gennetti was an inter started as an internal Google project. Um, they open sourced it in 2007. And as far as I can tell from my interactions with the Google employees I know that work on Gennetti, it's primarily used for their back office operations um, in the various offices. It's not used for the public, um, uh, public production sites, and it's not using, used for their uh, compute engine that they just released not too long ago. Um, it's for things like DNS servers or uh, development servers that uh, the employees need to have, and so forth. Um, they really focused on making it hardware fault tolerant. They didn't want to buy expensive hardware 
and maintain it. They wanted to buy their cheap hardware like they do in their server in their regular servers and just deal with failure via software, which is kind of what they do. So they kind of went with the approach of using local block level storage, which for them worked really well. And you know, like I say, they're trying to use commodity hardware. And uh, that's kind of their goal. <coughs> as far as its components, you have uh, essentially four daemons that run. Um, you have the master daemon that, that runs on the master node that controls the whole cluster. You have a node daemon, and it kind of controls all of the low-level functions such as storage management, VM control, and so forth. Um, you have a configuration daemon that provides a way to query the configuration, copying the configuration between the nodes. And then it has an API daemon that runs on the master node, which provides a remote API to access Gennady outside of the command line. They also have some optional tools that help with auto allocation and rebalancing. So um, these H tools are actually written in Haskell. And they provide a way of when you deploy VM, you don't have to worry about what node it goes on. It just picks it for you. Um, if you take a node out of rotation and you want to rebalance your cluster, you can use a tool to rebalance your cluster using Gennady H tools. It's a pretty handy tool. Now with Gennady, um, Gennady is kind of like a base layer. It doesn't really do, it's not really considered a true cloud platform, I would say. Um, it's basically just VM management. That's really what it's for. Um, <coughs> You know, it, like I said, it's only a command line interface, so it doesn't really have a lot of user-facing functionality. So there's been a couple of third-party add-ons or projects that have spun out of Gennady itself. The first one being Gennady Web Manager, and this is a project that started at the Open Source Lab, and it was really intended to be um, kind of a web version of what you have on a command line, um, kind of targeted for the system, system administrators more than the users. Um, but it really added permissions and group capability. So if you did want to give access to VMs to users and you only wanted them to have console and power access, you could do that. Um, if you wanted to make one of the users a group admin so that users can just sign up and they can add those users to that group to that same permission, you can do that. Um, you could add even more uh, permissions. So you can do quotas. So you can say, oh, you can only make, uh, you have you know, 30 gigs of space and 20 gigs of of RAM or whatever, you can split out your VMs how you want. Um, and so we have that capability in that as well. Um, but really, it's just, it's just a UI front end in front of Gennady is kind of what its intended goal. It's still kind of a <coughs> beta project. There's a little quirks and bugs, and we're trying to move around fixing the interface. But it's pretty useful, and a lot of users are using it. And we're using it right now as well. Um, another one is called Cinefo, which apparently is a Greek word for cloud. Um, about the same time we created Gennady Web Manager, I met up with uh, one of the primary developers of Gennady at LinuxCon in Boston. And at the same time, some folks from GRNet and Greece were there, and they were use heavy users of Gennady as well. GRNet is basically the Internet 2 of Greece. Um, but anyways, they're a really heavy user of Gennady, and we initially started doing Gennady Web Manager together, but they really had bigger ambitions on what they wanted to do. And really what they wanted to do, they had a user base of basically a couple thousand users, and they wanted to be able to deploy manage systems or VMs, kind of self-service. And they were already invested in Gennady, and they really liked the architecture of Gennady. They didn't want to switch to OpenStack or something else. And so what they wanted to do was create Gennady as a cloud service um, and creating an application layer on top of Gennady to do that. Um, and so really, you can think of it as a cloud, an, AP, an extended API, and a user interface. Um, <coughs> it has support for DRBD, which is RD and Gennady, uh, OVM, shared file, and then they added support for RDB, which is essentially Ceph and Rados uh, file systems. So <coughs> they really had some big ambitions with it. And this really changes uh, Gennady's uh, appeal to a lot of people, I think, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, a little bit more about G Gennady Web Manager. It's Django-based, so it's Python. Like I said, already targeted for sysmins. Um, if you just want to be able to use Gennady and have a simple uh, web interface, this is great. You can use it the same instance with multiple clusters, um, and then you can have permissions the same way throughout it. Um, and I said, we're the primary contributors. Um, I do have some screenshots so you can see what it looks like. 
Um, <coughs> this is actually on our supercell cluster. So you can kind of see what it looks like. That's, that's not Java running. That's a HTML5 um, open source project called NoVNC embedded into uh, Getting Web Manager. And I think says Nefo uses the same thing. So we can connect through it. And we use a, a VNC off proxy so that the VNC port resides on a, uh, a closed network, but the web interface talks to it and has a temporary password to connect to it. So that's how we do the, the, uh, the VNC out through that. So it's, we don't have to expose VNC to the world, basically. Another shot of like taking a detailed look at a, at a VM. You can see uh, who owns it. You can see, ooh, I wanted to use this big, uh, <laughs> it's like a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> but the owner is uh, Drupal owns this one. It's running. Um, it's running on Supercell 2. Um, it's running Debian Squeeze. Um, that's actually the port that the VNC is running on. That's how much memory, how many virtual CPUs, and then some more information. And it goes further down, but I can't do it in a single screenshot. Um, but yeah, that's what, what it looks like from a Gennetti Web Manager point of view. Um, and there's a lot more screens in there. <coughs> now, Synnefo. I just saw a presentation at Fosnum a month ago by the primary lead tech for this project, so it was really great. And I've used a couple of slides from his presentation. Um, but it's components, and it looks a little bit easier when I show the next slide because it shows some of the diagrams. But basically, you have Cyclage, which provides the compute network image service. So the, I think this is essentially the web front end. Now, put a little disclaimer, I haven't really played around with this too much, and I haven't had a chance to fully deploy it myself. So like I say, take what I say with a grain of salt, but I'm really excited about this project because they put a lot of effort into it. They've also created a file block storage service called Pythos. Um, they recently created a block storage service called Arcipedio, or Arcipedio. Um, and then they have this self-identity service that actually ties in with, uh, I think, Shibboleth quite a bit. And really what it does is it adds cloud -like, true cloud-like features to Gennetti. Um, some things that I noticed, they even had a handy command line utility that basically talks OpenStack to it. So if you wanted to deploy, instead of, you know, if you're a, a developer and you don't want to deal with a GUI, I just want to deploy something, you could use their command line utility in theory and deploy a Gennetti instance really quickly, and you don't even know it's Gennetti in the background. Now, as far as what this looks like, <coughs> and this is the slide that I borrowed, this is what OpenStack basically is, is it's everything. Um, it uses KVM primarily in the bottom, or Zen, um, Libvirt for managing all of that, and then OpenStack basically has all the other components underneath there. Now, how does Gennetti look like from uh, using Synefo? So you have KVM in the bottom. Gennetti also supports Zen, I should note, uh, but I'm a big KVM fan. Um, and then Gennetti provides the node in the cluster level where it actually provides the, the service. And then Synefo is this part. So it provides the cloud storage part that kind of ties in, an API and a user interface. Um, so it adds an extra layer on top of Gennetti. Now as a Gennetti admin, you can still use Gennetti as you want, basically, which is great. And that's the same with Gennetti Web Manager. Um, we tried to make it so that it was easy to go back and forth. Um, <coughs> let me talk a little bit more about how this actually looks. I like how the Sysamen has a little smoke pipe. <laughs> Um, so you have your individual Gennetti clusters with all your nodes. Um, then you have the Rados storage cluster. And the reason why they chose Rados is that um, they wanted to do deduplication. They wanted to be able to expand easily. Um, I don't have a lot of experience in it, but um, there's an excellent blog post on their website that you can check out and see the reason why they picked RDB and Ceph with it. Um, but it works really, really well, and they can scale really quickly. Um, and then they added this little layer in between it all to kind of tie things together a little bit neater. Um, they've contributed quite a bit to Gennetti itself. I think in the upcoming 2.7 release, they were the largest contributor, actually, to Gennetti, which is amusing since most of it's Google employees. <clears throat> and then on top of it, we have the cloud layer, which has the SlideKit clades interface and the Pythos, which talks to the storage. So as a user, you will talk to the web interface. So it's a really intriguing design, from what I can tell. <coughs> um, 
I did try deploying it uh, this week. Um, fortunately, I didn't quite get it going. But um, it seems to be really geared well with Debian. So if you're a Debian user uh, using Squeeze, it's pretty easy to deploy right now. Um, I imagine making RPMs wouldn't be too hard, but they basically have packaged up all the various components. Um, currently, they have their own version of Gennetti that's patched because the upstream patches haven't made it back in. But it looks really intriguing. They basically are running, I think, around 2,100 virtual machines with about 1,700 users on their cluster, um, and everybody seems to be going pretty well. So I'm pretty excited about it. Give it a try. Um, I wouldn't probably use this on our main production cluster, um, but we also have a test build cluster for open source projects that I think I might try using this. Um, we're also at the university level thinking about building out a new research cluster, and I think this might be a really good platform if, if it doesn't, isn't too complex. Um, and one neat thing about the API <coughs> is that it actually does talk OpenStack. They decided to write their API as OpenStack. So if you already have tools that are using OpenStack, this might work pretty well. Um, this is a really fairly new project, so there might be bugs and quirks, and they might be shifting things around. But I know they've spent a lot of time to get this going, and they're pretty cool as well. So kind of what do I see Gennetti as compared to the others? You know, you're really building up, using Gennetti kind of as the base of building something on top of it. So it's really a stable virtualization platform in its core. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't really change that much. Doing upgrades is really easy. You can, one thing that I really love is that you can build tools to extend Gennetti to your, to your needs really easily. You know, if you want to build um, your own tool that you use your interfaces with, sure, you can do it. You know, you already have something. Um, one thing that I was actually considering looking at is uh, we're finally trying to switch over to Puppet from CF Engine, and we're looking at using Foreman for, for doing some node management. Well, they have a nice little interface there that can tie into AWS, Libvirt, VMware, and all that, but they don't have a connector to Gennetti. Well, heck, this would be really cool to just, I could just do this with Gennetti. I can tie it in there and, and be able to use Foreman with uh, managing my Gennetti clusters. Um, you can really also augment Gennetti with other technologies quite easily. Um, I'm actually taking a look at using GlusterFS as one idea for our, our needs. Um, there's been some recent um, uh, developments in the KVM area with Gluster where you can actually directly attach Gluster storage to KVM and get an incredible performance increase out of it. So I'm really, really interested in that and because that would really enable us to grow. Because one problem with Gennady's layout is that it uses DRBD and that only scales so far. Um, and the thing that I like being a SISM at heart, it just makes me happy because it's easy to manage and it's easy to upgrade. So now I'm going to compare each of the components. <coughs> and I'm not going to go to each individual things, but I'll kind of touch base on some of these. So from a storage point of view, uh, I thought these were the three areas that were kind of important. Does it deal with disk images? Can it access block devices? And what kind of fault tolerance does it have? Um, they all in some way do it, but they do a little bit differently, obviously. So I, had, I did, actually gave this presentation last year at OSCON, and when I did it last year, Gennetti kind of had the not-so-happy side, but then when I noticed that Senefa was out, it actually made things a lot better. So you know, as far as disk images go, most of them have some, some kind of disk service, which is important if you have a lot of users. Um, if you want to have access to block devices, um, that's great. That's typical if you want to have a large storage device or you, don't want, or you want it to be persistent. Um, a lot of these cloud architectures kind of assume that the, the VMs are cattle versus you know, pets. So you can throw away the, the cattle VMs and you, you don't want to worry about the storage. <clears throat> well, to me, also, block devices means uh, potentially higher performance, at least in the, in the case of Gennetti with it being local storage. And then fault tolerance. That was the one thing that a lot of these kind of was an afterthought where they're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. Um, <coughs> they all kind of do it a different way. And I know initially most of them kind of assumed, oh, you build out the storage architecture, and the storage architecture is the fault tolerant by itself. It's not really tied into the cloud platform at all. In the case of Gennetti, it's built in from the beginning. Um, that's just a part of it. Now, they have added features so that you, if you want to have something like a nice sand that you already paid for, you can use that. Um, you know, some of them use rsync for some kind of a back end. That might work, depending on what you're doing. Um, 
but yeah, a lot of the, the storage part is you have to build your storage to maintain it. Now, I haven't checked recently, but I think several of these have improved this quite a bit. So this might have changed since the last time I've looked. Now on the VM comparison, VM image comparison, <coughs> they all do pretty well, um, except Gennetti. Gennetti's, uh, by default, the way you deploy VMs is really kind of odd. Um, when I first got into it, essentially Gennetti was used only on Debian systems. And they essentially used Deb Bootstrap to install the instances. Um, they, did, uh, they would keep caches of it. When I got into Gennetti, I decided, well, I wanted to have an image-based service. So I created my own um, instance creation script called Instance Image. And it basically, you create a tarball image or a disk image or a QMU disk image of a uh, you know, your VM and you deploy it. Well, it's a kind of a manual process to keep the image up to date. The user can't really do it, but I could deploy a VM in 30 seconds, which I think was pretty awesome and it's fully functioning. So on the case of OpenStack, I mean, all, most of them do do really well. If uh, the Amazon API is important to you, you know, that's something to consider. Gennady by itself, its remote, remote API does, is not compatible with AWS at, at all but you could certainly interface something and make it do that. Um, as far as cell service, you know, they kind of had a built in, Gennady by itself doesn't have it, but you can obviously augment it with other uh, third party tools to do that. As far as the service comparison goes, um, they all do it. Um, you know, you have user quotas, console access, um, user management, <coughs> um, some kind of a web interface. The web interface can vary on each platform. I didn't get a chance to get screenshots of each to kind of show you, uh, but I'd recommend you take a look and, and see what you like. Um, you know, and same thing with Gennetti. By itself, it doesn't do this, but with third-party tools, you can achieve the same, same goals, um, which is really nice. From a networking point of view, um, depending on your network layout, this can be a big deal. Um, pretty much, uh, OpenStack, Eucalyptus, and CloudStack all have some type of networking layer that manages the network, whether you want to do auto allocation or you want to kind of have some kind of user-defined role or you want to do layer two. Um, <coughs> Gennady by itself doesn't. Um, in my case, our network wasn't that complex, so I didn't have to worry about it. Um, but I know, um, especially with SysNefo, you can do some pretty cool things with networking. They actually, that was one of the major patches they added was the network layer. So there's now you can manage your network from Gennetti if you want to, which before you could not do, um, which is a, kind of a nice feature that got added. So some other factors to kind of consider through all of this. Um, like I say, a lot of this is my opinion. Um, but the code base, you know, I, you know, you look at each of them, Python or OpenStack is mostly Python. Eucalyptus is half Java, some C. Uh, CloudStack is primarily Java. And then Gennetti is kind of this mix of Python and Haskell and a little bit of shell. Um, as far as hypervisor goes, if VMware support is important, you know, the uh, OpenStack, Eucalyptus, and CloudStack is really good for that, um, depending on what you're using. But Gennetti doesn't really have that support. Um, it has, Gennetti has limited Linux container support too, I should mind you. But if somebody really wants to contribute a patch, they would be really happy to fix that. Um, Gennetti was originally developed using Zen. Um, and I think Google's still using Zen with Gennetti. Um, but I think most new users are using KVM. Um, from a Sysmin point of view, I care about the installation requirements. Um, <coughs> and this is where kind of the opinions come in. Um, I probably should change the installation requirements for OpenStack from medium to large because it's just, with all the new components they have now, it's just really, really hard to keep track of it all and all the configuration and all the databases and everything. It's just like a, so many single points of failure that can happen. Um, with Eucalyptus, it's kind of large too. Um, they have now created a nice installation tool to make it easier, but it still has quite a bit of stuff in there. Um, CloudStack isn't quite so bad. Um, but they still have, they make it easiest to, to install as well. I think they have either a script or a chef or puppet module that will do it. And then Gennetti is pretty low. I mean, 
yes, it has Haskell. Um, if you get beyond that, um, there really aren't that many Python libraries or Haskell libraries that you need. Um, but it really is a fairly low impact on the installation requirements. You don't need Java. You don't need to install more than, I think the installation requirement list is maybe up to 12 or 13 packages when OpenStack is probably in the 20 to 30 range. Um, it's pretty insane. Um, the maintenance one, that's the one that was hard for me because I couldn't do like an upgrade to see what it was like. Um, but just kind of looking at the architecture, this is kind of what I, what I looked at. With OpenStack, and, and from what I've heard from friends that use it, um, trying to do an upgrade in OpenStack is not easy. Because um, you have so many components and you have to upgrade them all at the same time. And if you shut them down, you can't really keep your instances running. So <coughs> they, may, they may have fixed this. I'm not sure. But that's something to consider. Eucalyptus, I think this kind of depends on the size of machines you have. I think if you have a lot of machines, it might get more complicated. But in general, I think they do a decentish job. From what I can tell, they've improved it quite a bit. But like I said, I haven't got a chance to really try it. Um, I think CloudStack is probably kind of in the same boat where it's kind of like a monolithic application. So it's a little bit easier to manage and upgrade. Um, so there aren't as many moving parts, per se, that you need to touch. But there's still you might have to you know, take VMs down to kind of do some of the stuff. Now we get to Gennetti. This is something that I love about Gennetti, is when I upgrade Gennetti, I don't have to shut down my VMs. Um, I do have to shut down Gennetti, but it, that doesn't stop the VMs. It just means I can't manage the VMs. So I can shut down Gennetti, upgrade, run the simple tool that updates the configuration file, and do, if I, as long as I follow the steps exactly, I can upgrade Gennetti really well. I've gone, our original production cluster started at 2.0, and it's moved all the way up to 2.5.2, I think, as where we're at. <coughs> and I have yet to have it completely fail on me, knock on wood, um, when I do that. Um, there's a few little quirks that happen sometimes, but I don't have an outage, which is a big deal. Um, and I know they, they've done a really good job of documenting the upgrade process. So as far as upgrades go, I love Gennetti. Now, as far as installation goes, this kind of depends. Um, you know, some of them are included in a distribution, so you can use them really easily, or some of them have their own repositories, which you can get the latest and greatest from. Um, but really what I notice is just the amount of upfront configuration you have to do once you get everything installed. Like OpenStack is insane. There's so many things you have to touch to get it going. Um, th things like Puppet make it easier, but still, it's, it's quite overwhelming. Um, and then getting the cluster just off the ground is a really big deal to me. So when I look at OpenStack, it's really well included in Ubuntu. Um, there's lots of configuration, but there's a Puppet Labs module that makes it easier. Um, Eucalyptus, they have a really good install guide. They used to not have it. They had a lot of users whine about it, and they changed it finally. Um, they have both yum and apt repos, which make it easy. Um, and it didn't really take that many commands. They've really simplified the initialization of it. So as long as you stick to uh, operating systems they really support, it's pretty easy to get going. CloudStack, they provide their own repos as well. Um, they have a really good install guide, make it easy. And really, there wasn't that much configuration that was needed to get it going, um, which was pretty nice. And then Gennetti, um, including in Debian and Ubuntu. Um, there's a couple of app repos for CentOS out there. <coughs> so it's not too hard to get it going. They have pretty good documentation. Um, I know they have a quick start guide, which is really nice to kind of walk through, but it works out pretty well. Um, and the initialization is really easy. It's one command and it's done. And it takes only a few seconds to do. So it works really well. Now, what are their strengths and weaknesses? This is kind of another way of taking a look at it. So when you take a look at CloudStack, it has a really young code base, um, at least from you know, the open source world uh, point of view. Its future is kind of uncertain with all of the corporations that move around with it. The community isn't quite sure what's going on and so many moving parts. And the initial configuration is a nightmare. Um, but the strength of it is, is it's a single code base. It's all Python. Um, it has a huge growing community um, thanks to their uh, marketing effort. And there's a lot of corporate support. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of potential in OpenStack. Um, I think it's something you don't want to ignore, but it's something that you might want to be careful about if you want to go all in. Um, eucalyptus, um, the installation requirements are kind of big, but 
if you get by, by that, it's not a big deal. Um, it's really configurable, but it's not very customizable. So you've, if you want to try to do something outside of what Eucalyptus thinks you should do, that's kind of hard to do. Um, so as long as what Eucalyptus provides works for you, then it's not a problem. And then they kind of had that community inclusion problem, which is kind of a big deal in open source, but I know they've been working on it the last several years, fixing that. Um, if you want to pay for it, they have really good commercial support from what I understand. They do have fault tolerance capability. Um, <coughs> during that time period when they went open core, what they basically did was uh, write components that directly access uh, proprietary equipment like SANS and uh, other kind of various uh, storage technology. So if you have that and you want to use a cloud platform, they're kind of one to go with. Um, and they kind of offer a nice hybrid cloud solution. So say you already have stuff in Amazon, but you want to kind of have a private cloud to do stuff here and you want to be able to move back and forth quite easily, Eucalyptus might be a solution in that regard. Um, I've, heard, I've heard mixed results on whether how good that is or not, but you know, the jury's out on that. Um, cloud stack. Um, I'm a sysadmin, I don't like GUIs, so GUIs kind of go minus minus for me. But it seems very, very GUI centric. There isn't much you can configure on the command line. Everything is basically done in, in the GUI. Um, from what I could tell, the last time I looked, it's basically a shingle, single Java core, which can be a weakness and a strength. But um, it's kind of, I thought it was kind of weird. It was just one core that you had to install basically on all your nodes. And its AWS integration isn't that good. It, I think it's kind of there, but not the best. But the, the nice thing is, is that the GUI is really nice and slick. It's easy to use. Um, the stack itself is fairly simple. Um, I know it's ironic I say stack for cloud stack. But yeah, the cloud, I think the stack itself is fairly simple to understand. I think it was you know, four or five different components. And then you kind of, it was kind of like an onion from there. And it seemed like the storage backend, you could customize it. So based on what you wanted to use, it was fairly easy to deal with. As far as Gennetti goes, um, you know, it's a very admin-centric, sysadmin-centric uh, cloud platform, if you want to call it a cloud platform, at least by itself. This slide is more about Gennetti by itself. Um, its VM deployment is really weird um, compared to the others. It's not, when it was originally created, clouds didn't really exist. Um, and so that concept really wasn't ingrained in initially. So long term, they may fix it and improve it, but for now, it's kind of difficult to understand initially. Um, there's no AWS in integration at all, but they've created tools to make it a little bit easier. They've added tools that can convert a Gennetti instance into an OVF compatible format so you can import it in the virtual box or wherever else you can import that same format. So they've added tools to make that easier. Um, but it's not automatic by any means. I think its biggest strength is this fault tolerance is built in. Um, notice I never actually have said HA, um, but fault tolerance meaning that it's, if a node goes down, um, it doesn't take that many keystrokes to fix that and bring up the VMs online on another node, basically. Um, that's really what it was intended for. Um, but it does create tools so you can make it H, HA more, more HA-like. Um, the other thing that I love about Gennady, it's really customizable. As you can see with the third-party tools, you can really build your own cloud how you want it with Gennetti, and you don't have to worry about the VM management layer. You can just worry about the user, user level area. Um, and to its core, it's really simple to manage and maintain. All the command line uh, functions are fairly well documented. There's easy help on the command line, great man pages. Um, the commands mostly make sense. Some of them still kind of don't make sense. Um, but overall, it's pretty easy to main, main, manage and maintain. So which platform should you choose? Um, this really depends on a lot of things. So how big is your deployment? Are you dealing with you know, a couple racks worth of machines? Or are you dealing with a whole data center of machines that you want to make a cloud? Um, what types of services are going to be hosted? You know, are you going to be having uh, a lot of databases running on it? Are you going to have a lot of web-centric stuff? You know, what, what really needs to be deployed on it? You know, what's your user base? Is it going to be mostly sysadmins accessing it? Or are users going to be spinning things up, kind of like an AWS type environment? You know, that can be a big deal. Um, you know, your hardware budget limitations. Um, yeah, that's a pretty big deal. At the lab, we don't have much money to buy hardware. We generally get with what we have. And that was one thing. We actually got uh, NetApp 
really, really nice net app to donate it to us, but we couldn't use them because we couldn't afford the support contract and license to actually use them. And here's the kicker. NetApp is a member of the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation got NetApps themselves, but they still wouldn't give them a free license. <laughs> so, yeah, and I've always had the, uh, at the lab, I always have said we should eat our own dog food, and we actually benefit the open source world in, in, in return. So I decided to go with this. I'm like, well, we have a bunch of servers. Let's find something that works with that. We just have to buy more hard disks, which isn't that expensive. And so... You know, that was kind of one way of looking at that. You know, how much of a complexity of a system is it? You know, you're going to have to have a one FTE managing the whole system, or you just want to be able to have, you know, just one slice of the FTE to manage it. Um, you know, with Gennetti, um, you know, I've, I'm the, I was the only full-time system for basically five years, and I had five or six undergraduate students who worked under me. You know, outside of the initial setup and deployment, there really isn't much maintenance that goes on with Gennetti itself. It just works, you know. With the other stuff, it gets a little more complex. You know, <clears throat> how important to you is fault tolerance? You know, is, it, is the fact that the, the VMs can go down and you don't really care if they've lost data a big deal or not? Or are you treating your VMs more like pets and you don't want them to go down ever and they actually have data on them that you don't want to have go away? And you want to be able to bring them back online easily. You know, that can be important. And then, you know, are you dealing with other clouds? Are you wanting to move back and forth between public and private clouds? That can be kind of, you know, depending on what you want to do. So kind of looking at each of them, uh, it kind of depends. <coughs> so from an OpenStack point of view, uh, you know, its philosophy is you have public and private clouds and you have some kind of a standard API. Um, its public cloud compatibility apparently is not quite completely AWS compliant, um, but I think it kind of works. Um, and I think OpenStack is if you want to do a data center-wide si sized deployment of some cloud, because it's really designed to handle that, that, that scale. Um, it's complex because you need to, it, things get complex the larger you get. Um, and it does have some fault tolerance built in. Um, and I think they've probably have actually improved that in the last couple of releases. I haven't checked recently to see if they've done that. Um, from Eucalyptus, it's really great for the public-private hybrid compatibility. You want to go back and forth. has pretty good idea by us. Um, I think it's also really good for a large number of machines. Um, I don't know if data center-wide is a good way, but uh, still pretty good. Um, <coughs> and, you know, they've, the fault tolerance has gotten pretty good overall. Um, CloudStack, it's kind of the, you know, private. It's decent for the private. Um, some AWS support. Um, I would say CloudStack is good for like a medium group of machines. So maybe you have a whole row of machines and you want to run CloudStack. That might be a good environment for that. I know that the university was actually considering CloudStack at one point. Um, and I think that's kind of a good one to take a look at. And then there is some fault tolerance that's built in, but you kind of have to work on it. Um, with Gennetti, it's good for really private. Um, has node failure, local storage. Um, you can do public cloud compatibility with uh, Cinefo. Um, <coughs> I view Gennetti as great for a smaller group of machines. Now, small might be different for some of you. Um, this can mean from a single machine. Um, I, I think technically they say up to 40 machines, but this is per cluster. So um, the problem with Gennetti is it has a jobs, job locking system to ensure that jobs don't run into each other and that when you bring up a machine, it does things in the proper order. Having that really sane job locking system means that if you send it a bunch of jobs, the locking mechanism makes things slower. So when you create a larger Gennetti cluster, things get slower to deploy more VMs at once, basically. Um, they've tried to fix that quite a bit in different ways. Um, they have a feature called node groups, so bas which basically you can think of it as, here's a rack of machines in this cluster. I want all of my VMs to all reside in this rack so that the network traffic doesn't go outside of the satellite uh, uh, switching equipment. And so then the locking mechanism is only in that node group. Um, but they're also making improvements other places. Um, I, mean, I mean, heck, you know, GRNet made it work with that many VMs, so obviously they're making it work. But that's definitely a, a part of Gennady that is a pain. You know, at the lab, we don't deploy VMs that often, so <coughs> it's not that big of a problem. 
And fault tolerance is really where it's really great at. You know, I've been moving a lot of production instances to it, and it's actually more reliable than my hardware sometimes, um, which is great. I don't have to worry about RAID underneath it. But I actually, the nice thing is, is I have an extra layer of it, because uh, the machines I do with my real production stuff is the systems are all still PSU. They have, you know, RAID and everything. So I get really extra layer of fault tolerance being able to fail things over between two nodes really easily. So <clears throat> why would you choose OpenStack? Well, like I said, young project, corporate backing, code base, uh, really large deployments. Um, the web interface is long, young, and I noticed it was pretty limited in what it can do, um, at least the last time I took a look at it. Um, you only need to use the components you need, so if you only want to do S3 storage, there you go. Um, if you only want to do compute with a few things here, you don't need to deal with the IDD management layer, then there you go. So it's kind of nice. So you, you don't have to do the whole stack if you don't want to, if you don't need to. Um, but it's pretty complex in its setup. But it, it has pretty decent APIs. Um, Eucalyptus is actually a fairly mature project. It's been around quite a while comparatively. Um, there's a lot of features. The code base is kind of complicated. Um, really great commercial support. Um, and with its refocus into open source, it's really helped um, kind of bring them back to center where, where they should be as far as the open source projects are. As far as CloudStack goes, um, there really isn't much distribution support, so if you want to be able to app get installed, you can't do it, but they have a repo, so you can do it. Um, there's a lot of features. Um, you know, it has some fault tolerance built in. Um, it has, I viewed it as a monolithic component architecture, which may or may not be good or bad. <coughs> and there's been a lot of recent ownership shifts with the project. But I think with it being an Apache now, um, it's probably going to be pretty stable now. And it seems that each time I interact with folks with it, it seems like it keeps doing much, much better. And it, it's actually used by some level, several large hosting providers. I want to say, was it GoDaddy that uses this? I don't remember. One of the really large ISP or type companies like that use this. Um, so you can scale it up pretty well. And it's a pretty good option out there. So it's definitely, if I, if I would need to choose something between, if I couldn't choose Ganetti, I probably would look at CloudStack next, is my opinion, my, and my, what I would do. Um, choosing Ganetti, fault tolerance, smaller clusters, less complexity. Um, I think it has much better performance because um, of the local storage. Um, but it only solves the compute problem. So you have to use third-party tools to really augment its capability to be like the other cloud platforms. Um, I know I've been touting Gennady quite a bit, and <clears throat> I'm sure some of you have never tried it out before. Um, I actually have a Vagrant testing environment. How many of you know what Vagrant is? Oh my, I could give a whole talk about that. Um, it's an awesome development tool. It basically uses VirtualBox or VMware, and it allows developers to have a production-like environment on their workstation really easily. So if you already have Puppet modules, and you want to just deploy, or they want to have a VM set up exactly like production, you can use it with Vagrant. Check it out. Um, anyways, uh, I have a Vagrant testing environment. So if you want to try out Gennetti, go to my GitHub and check it out. Make sure you meet, read the meet, read me to know exactly what's going on. But you can test a one to three node setup. Um, I have CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu there, so you can try whichever flavor you want to try out. Um, and then I also have a walkthrough PDF guide. So if you actually want to walk through the steps and see what it's like to do a failover, you can try it out yourself. Um, <coughs> I originally created this so that our Gnu Web Manager, or Gnu Web Manager uh, developers can have a stable development environment. So don't expect the VMs inside of the VM to work, but running the commands you know, should work. Um, Trying to think what else about the Vagrant testing environment. Um, yeah, it, it's just a really good environment to try out. And if you have questions about Vagrant, let me know. Um, the guy behind it just recently uh, shifted his responsibilities. Uh, he, he left his job, and now he's working on Vagrant full time, getting sponsorships. And he's, there's going to be lots of awesome things. And actually, um, I've been toying around with the idea of tying Vagrant in with Gennetti. So imagine the concept of 
um, being able to, because the problem is with Vagrant is it's all local on your workstation. So if you're trying to solve a, test a problem that requires 100 nodes, you can't really do that unless you have a really expensive large workstation. Um, but what would be really cool is, hey, if you have a test Gennetti cluster um, and you have Vagrant, you have Gennetti support in Vagrant, maybe you can do it on a cluster somewhere else and actually test things out. So it's a really a great tool to test things like that out. Oh, didn't realize I had that on. Um, so yeah, try that out. And if you have any problems, let me know, because there's probably problems sometimes. <coughs> so what about the other ones out there? Um, you know, Open Nebula was out there. Um, I haven't really tried it that much, but from what I could tell, it's really geared towards the HPC community. Um, it didn't seem like it had a lot of traction. It was a little complex in some ways, but it's worth taking a look at. Um, I think it's still going well. Um, Nimbus, I haven't actually tried, but I looked it up. It exists out there. And then Overt is really lib, uh, a front end to Libvert. That's really a part of Red Hat's virtualization solution, um, but it's the open source side of it. So I've heard great things about it. It's a great community, um, but uh, it didn't really fit with our environment at the time. And um, it's definitely worth taking a look at. If you're a big Libvert user and, and you already are invested in that, Overt's the way to go with that. So in my end, I say there's no really single winner or loser, although you probably think I really want to go for get any. Um, but each of them kind of solve different problems. And it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, you really can't use one and solve everything. You kind of figure out what you need and kind of go for it. I highly recommend you try to each platform that you think fits well with you. Dedicate a couple of machines at least to try it out. Um, and kind of map out what your end goal is. Like what are you trying to get out of it? You know, thinking about scaling, manageability, fault tolerance. The three key things I would say that you need to consider with any of these platforms. And at the end, uh, I got to have a little slide with cats in it. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, let me know. Um, that's kind of my uh, contact info. Um, and also, if you want to find out more about the Open Source Lab, I have some of our social media uh, information up there as well. So um, are there any questions? Are you hosting any services for the university itself? Oh, at the Open Source Lab? Um, yes, but very few. Um, we're hosting the help desk solution that runs using our OTRS. Um, we're hosting that for the university. Um, but outside of that, we really don't host anything directly for the university. Um, there are talks about us, like with this research uh, cluster they want to build, that maybe we'd be a part of that. Um, but no, no, nothing, not directly, no. We're, we're really geared towards the external open source communities. So about a year ago, I, I think we did a similar study, but not necessarily looking at Kinetic, because that's, that's just sort of my, almost my first uh, orientation to it. Uh, but anyway, we did a some research on, on the, the open source cloud community and kind of focused in on eucalyptus to, do, to, to support one of our, our cloud infrastructures. We'd, we'd like to, I'll probably share that paper with you if, if mm -hmm. you want to take a look at that. But the other thing is, what do you think, the, what do you think that, that, that sort of the, the open source community is evolving around? I know, I know a lot of, uh, of, of support, as you said, has been, been pushed behind OpenStack. And, and a lot of people are sort of betting that it's going to sort of end up being OpenStack and Eucalyptus just because of the, of the corporate um, support. But uh, what, are your, what are your general thoughts? If you were a betting man, what would you say? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it would depend on the environment. If it's going to be like a huge company that wants to invest in it, um, you know, <coughs> I couldn't say either way which one it is. I mean, OpenStack has a huge marketing front right now. So it's hard to tell how much of it's actually true, actual push and, and interest versus not. Um, I think there's a lot of people trying to find ways of making OpenStack a solution. So I think it maybe offers the most opening for somebody to make it really work by making a real product out of it. Um, I think Eucalyptus does too, but uh, I, like, I'm not that familiar with Eucalyptus. But I think you could. I think it, I think they'll both play out really well. Um, I don't think 
things like Gennetti and CloudStack are going to go away. Because for those smaller shops, they don't need this other thing. You know? And I'm kind of a big promoter of Gennetti because it's kind of like the poor stepchild that never gets attention. You know? And once, especially when sysadmins find out about it, like, wow, I wish I knew about this a long time ago. You know? And so that's why I kind of I go out and I talk about it. And, and I, think, I think the evaluation that you provided is excellent. I mean, it's even from the standpoint of your characterization of OpenStack, I mean, it, it still is very difficult to work with. People are, like you're saying, trying to gut it out and make it work, but it, it it's really is difficult. The other thing is, uh, do you see any, you know, getting back almost to the eucalyptus use case, because you know they're now their affiliation with AWS is, is actually strengthening. Do you see that as a, I, I mean, do you see other open source cloud sort of providers uh, going that route too of sort of, Creating stronger affiliations with those those uh, sort of I think public, so yeah I think so because the the first run of the public cloud is oh my god I can make as many VMs as I want and then as they go through it they're like oh man this is really slow and it goes down all the time I have some stuff that I need to have up all the time or I want to retain that information internal to our network so and that's when they think about well I need to have my own private cloud what am I going to use so I think that's really the bigger push right now is that. You know, we took the approach that, well, we can't afford Amazon, and we had to pick a solution to make it work. But I think, I think pushing towards the public APIs are going to be really important. And, and I guess the last question is just that you didn't speak that much on security. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so just if you have anything that you'd like to sort of comment on that. Uh, security between all of them, I really didn't do a close evaluation of that. Um, I think, obviously, in any of them, you need to make sure you take a really good look at it. Um, I've always come with the perspective of the more the moving parts, the more likely something will break and create an opening. So I would be really wary of OpenStack with security. Um, I would think that uh, Eucalyptus and CloudStack probably is a little bit easier to deal with. Um, and then Gennetti, you know, unless you open up it with the other third-party tools, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Like we run our Gennetti nodes on a private network, and that way we keep it away from everything else. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the things we kind of lost our capability uh, to do is to have an all processing site for our satellite data processing systems. This was uh, because of a data center consolidation initiative. Uh, we used to have things in other buildings, and now they're all pushed into one building, which I showed you. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that line of servers, that, that was our alternate processing facility. Now, how uh, difficult do you think it would be to uh, spin up, say, a three-rack system in a remote location? P picture West Virginia or maybe way up north in Maryland somewhere, uh, at least 50 miles away. Three racks uh, and to run Gennady as the infrastructure and have different kinds of nodes like I showed you today, for a processing node, for a database node, for a, uh, I guess what we call it, a head node or controller, with about, uh, with one rack of that probably being storage. Do you think that Gennady would be a good way to spin up, say, 40 computers with I about so. half a petabyte of, machine, of, of storage? Yeah, I think it would totally fit that bill really well. Um, you probably would want to use the node group feature a little bit um, to get to maybe keep sure the mitigation, because something, I didn't go into detail about Gennetti, because that's not what this talk was about, but um, if you're using DRBD, which we primarily use, um, if you don't know what DRBD, it's like RAID 1 over the network. So you have a block device here and a block device here and two different servers, and you synchronously co uh, copy the block, the, the information over. It's an open source product that's in mainline. It's awesome. Um, but that's what it uses for the data replication. and. It uses a secondary storage network to do that. So, normally when you're just running VMs, unless you're doing a lot of I/O, um, it can produce a lot of traffic, or it doesn't produce a lot of traffic. But when you initially create a VM, it'll initially sync it the whole thing over, so that can take a little bit of time to get it going. Um, so, as long as you use the no grip feature to keep your network, uh, so it doesn't cross the network switches very much, that would probably work pretty well. Uh, one of the other things is we currently split up. Sing big hefty machines into lots of smaller machines, uh, like we run our 32-bit uh, OSs on 64-bit ones that are have a lot of uh, memory and lots of processors. Is it possible for us to scale the other way to have uh, to maybe do something like a, a Numalink type architecture, where we would have instead of uh, 
12 cores in a single machine, maybe 144 cores in a single machine using, uh, and, and, and also to glom the memory together using Gennady, or does it just not do that kind of HPC type application? I know it has CPU sim pinning support, so you can tell it to, to at least pin onto a particular CPU. I know it has that. I haven't used it a lot. I know they've been adding some support that maybe help with that, but I don't deal with that so much, so I'm not sure if they do. Mm. But I know they're making strides. I know on the, the disk uh, way, they actually added, or they're going to be adding support where you can dedicate a whole disk to a single VM. So if you want to, you don't want to have a, um, you know, a uh, hardware con or disk I.O. contention on a whole to other VMs, you can ded basically dedicate a single disk to it. So they're kind of going that approach with that. So maybe is my answer. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. Yep. Oh, did you? No, no sorry. Hi, thanks. Um, I got like one personal use case kind of kind of going in my head. Um, right now, we are on VMware. We got you know two nodes, maybe running thirty instances. Um, and say we want to go open source, spend a little less money. Do I do it now? Do I jump jump ship and go to one of these solutions? Do I wait six months? Do I wait a year? See if there's a winner, or like you know, a, a head horse. What are you currently or, using? VMware. Oh, VMware? Yeah. OK. Um, well, I'm obviously biased, but. Um, I'm asking for bias. I'm, uh, me personally, um, I, it depends on your use case. It sounds like Gennetti would fit well with your use case, with the okay. size that you have. So you know, take a look at it and see if it works. You know, are, you, are you deploying a lot of VMs off them, or are they kind of like pets, and they, you deploy them, and they're just there? Both. It's like literally like VMs we don't ever want to go down. We really, really, really need them, and then we have some like we don't care about. You know. I would say yeah, give Gennady a try and see what it, how it works. Um, are you dealing with any Windows machines on them? Uh, one or two. No. Yeah, I mean like with Gennady, I, I mentioned that deployment is a pain, but there's ways around it. Mm. So you don't have to use the deployment mechanism that Gennady has. You can basically do a no install, which it sets up the disks but does nothing else. And you can go back and say net boot, and then you can do pixie boot. Perfect. So if you want to do something crazy like Razor to do your awesome net boot installs, okay. there you go. Great. Great. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. Thanks. We have anybody on the telephone for questions? Doesn't look like it. So um, I'm glad you mentioned the AWS um, things. There is a lot of discussion regarding an overall cloud strategy that, of course, the information is what you should be looking at. And definitely, particularly here at NASA, we have all sorts of different sensitivity levels on the information. And we also have huge public audiences for some of our data and more limited uh, audiences for some of the other data. So it certainly appears that an overall mix on your development and your sharing of information based on using public or private cloud, based on your audience and based on the sensitivity of the data. So if you could speak just a little bit to the, okay, what, do I, what am I sharing and who, who do I need to share it to? How big's the data? Because certainly if you've got a huge audience and big data sets, possible. If you don't have sensitivity to the data, it seems renting some space briefly on a public cloud might be a much better way than trying to build that internally. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, obviously it depends on your budget, but um, a lot of the services like the S3 service is, you know, relatively cheap, but you, get, you can get a lot out of it. You know, so if you need to share a lot of files, that's the way to go, and you don't, you know, you're going to deal with a lot of bandwidth. Um, or you know, if you just want to retain files, you can use their archiving. I can't remember what it's called. Feature, you know, um, each of them kind of have that. So I definitely say I would think that leverage the public cloud as much as you can. Um, but if it's, uh, I kind of I don't deal with this environment that much. But um, <coughs> thinking off the top of my head, if it's if there's any information that 
you know, I don't want to, I, I don't, because obviously a VM could go away, but you don't know if the data will actually ever get re erased. I mean, it probably will, but there's always that possibility. I know most of these facilities destroy, you know, destroy their hard drives and so forth, but you lose that capability of directly accessing the hard, the, the, you know, the disks, so for example, in the data. So that's kind of the thing, like, depends on the use case. Did that answer it, or did I go in the wrong direction? Well, no, I mean, that's an interesting <clears throat> discussion of that, but certainly from a deployment methodology where I'm going to retain the authoritative copies and using various forms of mirroring or other types of data duplication mm -hmm. so that, okay, great, I'm going to use that free public as a distribution service, but I'm not necessarily going to put the crown jewels as the only place up there. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also thinking as far as the general management realm of saying, okay, I've got data that I'm going to share in various ways, and one of my options is going to be public, but I want to be able to manage the data in a workflow knowing that I'm going to end up with different delivery mechanisms, either in-house, external. Because you were certainly talking about the management structures of what VMs mm -hmm. and what you have in the cloud, and that could apply to different final delivery. It doesn't have to be your own private cloud that does it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think another way to put it, you know. Um, <coughs> As far as like, I kind of view the whole problem of like, if you post a picture on Facebook and you hit delete, does it really delete it? The answer is probably not. <laughs> you know, um, so that's kind of what I view about putting anything on the cloud. But if I have a, if I just have a virtual machine out there, you know, it's probably safe. Um, you know, are you kind of concerned about the orchestration of, you know, I have content private, but I have content public. How do I orchestrate it better? Is that kind of your question or? Okay, so if I'm provisioning data to an audience mm -hmm. and I have different types of data that I need to provision to an audience, mm -hmm. it would be easiest if I'm the data owner to have a workflow in place with different outcomes of where that data goes. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I could use the same workflow even or something different modifications or riffs on the same workflow mm -hmm. with different outcomes of where the data is shared. Yeah. So that was my sort of point is looking at it from, because you're talking about provisioning and setting services up and doing various things in the cloud. Well, it'd be nice if I say, okay, I've got a new thing I need to share out. Maybe it'll end up in Amazon. Maybe it'll end up in my private cloud. Yeah. I've got different options for various things. I've got different mobile apps for various things, depending on where I end up putting it. The ease and streamlining of that delivery system, it seems like many of your examples fit into that mold, except maybe the final point of where the data ends up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 